moving right along. Now we're going to talk about long-term climate regulation. We'll be talking about a couple things in particular. One, why was Earth's climate warm despite reduced solar luminosity in the distant past? Was Earth's surface ever totally frozen? Has Earth's climate generally been warmer or colder than today's climate? Why was the climate warm during the time of dinosaurs, and why has it cooled over the past few tens of millions of years? So to start off, the Earth has been inhabited by organisms for most of its history, as we saw a few lectures ago. This implies that surface temperatures have remained warm enough to support liquid water, obvious critical requirement for life. We know, however, that the Sun was 30% less luminous early in the solar system history. This suggests that the, quote, faint young sun paradox requires a stronger greenhouse effect or a lower planetary albedo. Now, this is explained here in a somewhat confusing way. The physics is correct, but the way it's presented has a bit to be desired. Essentially, what you want to think about here is the temperature scale in Kelvin. This is zero degrees centigrade. So 273.15 kelvins is equivalent to zero degrees centigrade. So this is our key temperature. Now, early on in the sun's history, it's believed that it was less bright. In fact, it was dim enough that it was incapable of heating the Earth's surface to the point that we would have liquid water. That only happened about 1.8 billion years ago or so. However, we know that there was liquid water much further in the geologic past than this. So something else must have played a role. Something else must have made up for this faintness of the early sun. The carbon cycle is one possibility. There's a strong relationship between the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the rate of silicate weathering. Remember, the more CO2 we put in the atmosphere, the more carbonic acid is generated the more carbonic acid generated, the lower the pH of any acid rain. Therefore, the more corrosive that rain is going to be to any rock. It's this feedback that has the ability to stabilize climate over long time scales because it causes atmospheric CO2 levels to increase when climate gets too cold or to decrease when it becomes too warm. When we lower temperatures by 10 degrees, the reaction rate is cut in half. When the reaction rate is cut in half, the amount of CO2 used up in those reactions is going to be cut in half. So when it gets cold, we use less CO2 in weathering. When it gets warm, the opposite happens. We double the reaction rate. So we dramatically increase the drawdown of CO2 because it's reacting with silicate rocks at a higher temperature. That's going to use up the CO2 in the atmosphere. There's also strong evidence that methane was really abundant before the rise of atmospheric oxygen. And we know from earlier in the course that it's a very effective greenhouse gas. As an example here, we have the moon of Saturn, Titan. Again, you can see this with a good pair of binoculars on most nights when it isn't cloudy. And the coloration is representative of the chemistry of the atmosphere. We'll get back to this in a minute. Was there an early atmosphere rich in CO2? There are some reasons to suppose this is correct. The continents would have been a whole lot smaller. They would have been islands in size compared to today. And therefore silicate rocks were less common. And the ability to store carbonate rocks in continental shelves would have been much less because there was no space on the shelves. There was nothing left, no place to put this shallow water carbonate rock that could have potentially formed. The rocks that came at this time were called comatiites. They erupted pretty commonly from the earliest earth history to about 1.5 billion years ago, but they became less common towards that period of time. And they're a very dark rock, a black, very magnesium-rich rock that comes from a lava that erupts at 1600 degrees. That's a very hot lava. And this rock would have been very susceptible to weathering. So any rock that was produced would be weathered quickly. And again, this leads to smaller continents early in the Earth's history. The degassing of planetesimals that would have hit the Earth would have generated a large amount of CO2 for the Earth's atmosphere. We see evidence from Venus. Venus has a, an atmosphere composed of an enormous amount, or enormous percentage of CO2. Venus is the same size as the Earth, approximately the same distance from the Sun. So there's some strong evidence that they would have had similar early atmospheres. However, this changing of CO2 concentrations is also going to be coupled with 
an amount of fine grain material that's generated at the Earth's surface. So when the Earth is, say, during the heavy bombardment period, it's getting smashed with these planetesimals that are generating dust. This very fine grain dust has a high surface area to volume ratio. It's exposed to acid rain and it's going to react quickly. So the climate during the heavy bombardment period is difficult to model. We don't have rocks for the most part. We don't have any good chemical record of what was going on. But after about 3.8 billion years ago, things start to become clear. We start to produce rocks that survive geologic time to the present. Now, with a sun that's 30% less bright, we would need 0.3 bars of CO2, about a thousand times the modern amount, which is around 420 parts per million, in order to keep the oceans from freezing. The amount of CO2 is available. It was available. And we can see that as 60 bars worth stored in carbonate rock. So we need about 0.5% of the CO2 from this carbonate rock in order to resolve the faint young sun paradox. Now here's a figure that, again, is a little bit confusing. And it's plotting CO2 on both of the y-axes. So we have partial pressure here in bars and concentration relative to present levels on the right y-axis. So what I want you to get out of this is that in general, CO2 has declined or decreased over the last four and a half billion years. Now this is a little bit of circumstantial evidence. We don't have good chemical evidence of this. We say that we do, but there are reasons to believe that that might be erroneous, let's just say. So in order to maintain liquid water at the Earth's surface, we're going to need a higher amount of CO2 in the past than what we have today. And some climate models have suggested this CO2 in the atmosphere was about 10 bars. And this would have generated an average surface temperature of 80 to 90 degrees centigrade compared to our modern average temperature of about 15 degrees centigrade. So we can see edging down from the very high early CO2 concentrations. We had a period of time about two and a half billion years ago where we enter the Huronian glaciation. And it's believed that the Earth's surface temperatures at this time were somewhere around 5 to 20 degrees centigrade. CO2 continues to decrease until we hit the late Precambrian glaciations, where again temperatures are estimated to be 5 to 20 degrees centigrade. And then CO2 continues to decrease until we get close to the modern and we have the onset of the Pleistocene glaciations about two million years ago or so. Okay, so this is possible, and it would also provide an explanation for the hyperthermophiles that we see near the base of the evolutionary tree. These are bacteria that can withstand high temperatures. In fact, that's where they live. They prefer that. So that lends a little bit of credence to that idea. The effect of methane on Archean climate is going to be pretty considerable. And this is in addition to carbon dioxide. Methane would have been fairly abundant prior to about 2.3 billion years ago when atmospheric oxygen was still rare because the Earth didn't have significant photosynthesizers at the time. The evolution of methanogenic bacteria would have converted much of the hydrogen in the atmosphere into methane. And this is going to have, again, an effect on the atmosphere, a pretty considerable effect on the atmosphere. That's illustrated here, where the early atmosphere would have generated methane from organic matter produced by photosynthetic bacteria. Models suggest that atmospheric methane was 1,000 ppm, maybe more, between 3.8 and 2.3 billion years ago. So we wouldn't need to add as much CO2 in our model if we have a much larger amount of methane. So this methane in the early atmosphere is going to be struck by the sun, and this photolysing, the splitting of the methane, uh, is going to be coupled with some combination with other atmospheric components. The result is that this light is going to stimulate the production of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAWS. These PAWS can become aerosols, eventually reach the ground, providing a source of organic matter, and also altering the sky, the color of the sky. The high methane concentrations would have made the Archean atmosphere look completely different from what we see today. Our blue sky is gone. Now, blue sky is generated by nitrogen and oxygen scattering incoming sunlight. That's what makes the sky appear blue. In reality, the sky doesn't have a color. During the Archean, though, 
the methane would have reacted with the sunlight polymerizing into those higher hydrocarbons, the PAS, and that would have resulted in the sky appearing to be pink or orange as we see with our images of Titan. Oh! Wait, we can't stop here. This is bat country. Most methanogens are either thermophiles or hypothermophiles, organisms with an optimal growth temperature between 40 and 80 degrees centigrade. So again, this makes sense now. It lines up the ducks are in a row. Methanogens with higher optimal growth temperatures have faster growth rates and shorter doubling times. Again, this lines up in, in favor of methane being an important component of early Earth's atmosphere. So this means the higher surface temperatures would have favored faster growing methanogens leading to an increase in methane production, leading to an increase in the greenhouse effect and an increase in surface temperatures. So is it likely that the Earth was covered with an organic haze? Yes, it's likely the Earth was covered with an organic haze. We also have climate regulation by what we're going to call the anti-greenhouse effect. Given the positive feedback by methanogenic hypothermophiles, you might expect the Earth's surface temperature became too high for life. Too much of a good thing like Venus. And we've wrecked the place. The highest temperatures life forms can survive today is about 113 degrees centigrade. But before we reach those temperatures, the amount of methane would have generated an anti- greenhouse effect. This is because methane absorbs red light and near-infrared such that only blue light is reflected. And we can see this when we look at Neptune and Uranus. They're blue. That's the reason these planets appear blue, because methane is absorbing the red. Saturn's gigantic moon Titan experiences this anti-greenhouse effect where sunlight is absorbed high up in the atmosphere, right at the top of the atmosphere, and it's re-radiated back into space as infrared energy without ever reaching the planet's surface, or in this case, the moon's surface, and then being re-radiated as black body radiation. That doesn't happen here because that radiation gets reflected from the top of the atmosphere. On the Earth, the organic haze layer couldn't have been too thick or the oceans would have frozen. So if we have too much haze, it's going to get cold. It's going to get so cold the oceans are going to freeze, and our story could stop there. However, it's likely as temperatures went down, the number of methanogenic bacteria also decreased, thereby decreasing the amount of haze. The feeding frenzy is coming to an end because the temperatures have gone down and these methanogenic hypothermophiles don't like it when it gets cold. So they don't reproduce as fast, they don't grow as fast. These factors together suggest pretty strongly that Earth's climate was regulated by a negative feedback loop between surface temperature, atmospheric methane, and carbon dioxide, along with the organic haze layer. As methane levels went up and carbon dioxide levels went down, the methane would have begun to polymerize, the organic haze layer would have formed, and this is exactly what we see happening in Titan today. Here we have another loop diagram. In this case, we're going to start out with methane production. As we change the ratio of methane to CO2 in the atmosphere, we're going to change its greenhouse effect characteristics. With a lot of methane, with a high proportion of methane to CO2, we're going to go into our haze production phase. This haze production is going to lower surface temperatures. Lower surface temperatures decrease the methane production. A decrease in the methane production decreases the ratio of methane to CO2, haze production decreases, and we're going to switch from methane controlling the atmosphere and its greenhouse characteristics to CO2 becoming more significant in controlling that. CO2 is now going to be regulating the Earth's surface temperature by its presence or absence. As soon as the atmosphere becomes thick enough to block sunlight, the anti-greenhouse effect would kick in and the surface would cool. This negative feedback loop would have stabilized Earth's surface temperature somewhere above the freezing point of water. How much above? We don't know. Probably not too much above, and it couldn't have gone too much below, causing some to bark. The long-term climate record now seems to be one of stability. That is incorrect. If we look at the geologic record up close in some detail, we see detail. And that detail indicates variation in climate throughout Earth's history. As we said the first, I think in the first lecture of class, climate has always changed. It always will change. That's just the way it works. 
getting that out of the way, we can say that paleoclimate has actually varied quite substantially with long warm periods that we call greenhouse climates, short cold periods that we call ice house climates. Today we're in an ice house climate. There may have been several snowball earth episodes when the earth's surface froze over completely. That's the most extreme example of climate change. So for relatively recent periods of geologic time, we can measure oxygen isotope ratios and carbonate. That's kind of my line of work, one of the things I do. And we could do this in carbonate sediment from deep sea cores, going back to the beginning of the deposition of that core. So this allows us to very clearly identify and characterize the glacial interglacial cycles of the last three million years. Emiliani first did that in the 1950s at the University of Chicago. So this works well for about 200 million years. But beyond that period, really beyond about 150 million years ago, we don't have seafloor sediment. We have shallow platform sediment. So we move from the deep sea to what's deposited on the continents to get a, an understanding of what's happened over the last 540 million years. How does this work? Well, we use plants and animals that are based on modern analogs. These modern analogs occur in specific climates. So at the top here, we can see a coral reef, and we see some palm trees. There's a clue here that this is California. So we can assume that the climate here is warm and sunny. These are the kinds of plants that would live in warm and sunny places. We can conclude that these corals live in warm, sunny waters, because this is found in warm, sunny water. So let's take a look at some other examples. Here we have some palm trees. Here we have some corals. In this case, this palm tree is growing in Iceland, which is very different from Southern California. Palm trees can handle the weather. So in fact, you'll see palm trees all over Iceland in uh, nicer yards, and you'll see them right up to the very northern tip of Norway in Hammerfest and Tromsø and in Longyearbyen and Svalbard even, up in the middle of the North Atlantic, 82 degrees north, near the North Pole, palm trees. Now, corals, on the other hand, much more reliable. These corals are from cold water in the Baltic, uh, water that is about six degrees or so. So corals don't turn out to be a good analog. Palm trees don't turn out to be a good analog. This is something to keep in mind when you're doing climate reconstructions. How good is your analog? In order to better understand these analogs as they're recovered from geological deposits, we have to keep track of where the continents were on the Earth's surface when those fossils were generated initially. And if we look at a reconstruction, like this one from Chris Scotese, then you'll see that there is a lot of possibility for climate change that's unrelated to any real change in atmospheric chemistry. It's just the position of the continents. Are you near the poles or are you near the equator? So this approach is not going to be useful for the Precambrian because we only had single-celled organisms. They may have been able to survive in ice. They may have been able to survive in hot water. They're pretty vigorous little creatures. So the best evidence we have for past glaciation on billion-year timescales is going to come from glacial deposits, it turns out. This is a picture from Iceland. This is the Vatanjoku in the background here. This is the largest glacier in Europe. It's really an ice cap, so it's bigger than a glacier. And um, what's happening here is this glacier is grinding away this basalt that was deposited at the mid-ocean ridge. And it's scooping that material up in the ice. And then this dirty ice is flowing down into this bay where it melts. When it melts, the rocks fall off or fall out of the ice and get deposited. Here's a close-up of that bay. This is the Blue Lagoon in the southeast of Iceland. There's a Blue Lagoon in the southwest of Iceland. It's also blue, but it's full of hot, sulfur-rich water that will give you skin conditions. This water will give you frozen skin. So here we can see bands of gravel and sand embedded in the ice. That's again coming off of here. The Vatanjoku moves down into this bay, the Blue Lagoon, and breaks up. And when this melts again, 
all this material is deposited. We can see that in the distant past, looking at rocks called tillites. These tillites are mixtures of uh, different grain sizes. That's one clue. The wide variety of grain sizes, the lack of sorting, the lack of rounding, and no reduction in angularity. So we have jagged pieces of sand, mud, pebbles, and cobbles all mashed together into a rock. These looked like this angular material when they were deposited, and that look is frozen in time. So these are going to form from the debris produced by glaciers grinding up rocks and then dumping them in piles known as moraines. Here we can see a lateral moraine formed on the side of a glacier. The glacier ran right down this valley here. It also ran down this valley here. It's now gone, and what's left behind is the rock that was within that ice. Here's another example here. This is a terminal moraine. You can think of this glacier as a conveyor belt that's operating sort of like this, well, maybe like this. And it's grinding up rock and it's bringing it down the valley until the ice melts and drops that rock. And that big pile of gravel left behind is a moraine. We can also see glacial striations in rock. These occur where glaciers grind rocks that are embedded in them against bedrock, leaving scratches or gouges in that bedrock. If we go to Kelly's Island in Ohio, over here in the Western Basin, uh, Cedar Point, the world's highest concentration of super roller coasters is right here, if you're interested in that kind of thing. Out on Kelly's Island though, we can see this great example of glacial striations, gouges. So during the last glaciation, Canadian bedrock was ground against this Ohio bedrock and generated these grooves and striations. New York, same kind of thing. This is a gneiss, very ancient Precambrian gneiss that's been ground and scoured by glaciation in the middle of the city. Other examples of glacial rocks include dropstones. These are chunks of large rock that were embedded in the ice. That ice rafts this large rock out into an open body of water. When that ice melts, the rock drops out of the ice into the sediment on the seafloor or the lake floor, and material then gets deposited over top of it. So a large, odd rock in the middle of fairly fine-grained sediment is a giveaway, dead giveaway. This is a famous, I don't know who took it. Um, oh, Paul Hoffman took it. I knew that dude. This is a famous dropstone photographed in marine strata in Namibia. We have a dropstone here that fell into some soft sediment, deformed the sediment below, and then had additional sediment deposited on top. It looks like it might have moved around a bit because there's some soft sediment deformation over here. So once it was deposited, it continued to get bumped around by something, maybe a current. Okay, so when we look at the long-term glacial record of the Earth, we see five significant periods of glaciation. The earliest examples of glaciation occur at 2.3 billion years ago, as identified by tillites and dropstones. This is known as the Huronian glaciation. For the next billion years, the Earth was ice-free during the late Paleoproterozoic and the Mesoproterozoic. So, the question is, why would the Earth experience a glaciation in the middle of a long-term ice-free period? 